the opportunities are endless. Look around, follow your passion. And you know, when you have a passion for something, you'll be great at it. Business of Architecture, episode 370. Hello and welcome to The Business of Architecture. I'm your host, Ryan Willard. And this week I'm speaking to Griff Davenport, FAIA, who is the DLR Group's Chief Executive Officer. Now, Griff leads the firm's executive leadership team and collaborates with the senior leadership to craft the firm's business strategy and to progress the evolution of DLR Group design. He's been instrumental in developing and driving the growth of the group's vertical markets and expanding their geographic footprints both nationally and internationally and it was a really fascinating conversation to speak with Griff as his entire career since 1980 has been solely with the DLR group so he talks about how his career has evolved, his role in business development in establishing new offices such as the one in Minneapolis and how they have grown and developed and specialized in various sectors such as education and of course we go deep into the importance of culture mission vision and values in a practice and leadership so sit back relax and enjoy griff davenport This podcast is produced by Business of Architecture, a leading business consultancy for architects and design professionals. This episode is sponsored by Smart Practice, Business of Architecture's flagship program to help you structure your firm for freedom, fulfillment and financial profit. If you want access for our free training on how to do this, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you want to speak directly to one of our advisors about how he might be able to help you, Please follow the link in the information. Griff, welcome to the Business of Architecture. How are you? I'm terrific. Nice to be here. Fantastic. Thanks for the invitation. My pleasure. My pleasure. Very excited to be speaking with you. And you are the CEO, the CEO of the DL, DLL Art, the DLR Group. Let me say that again. Yeah. Start again. <laughs> correct. Correct. DLR Group. The DLR Group. Um, and. Yeah, so I'm I'm really curious actually to to explore how did this begin? How did your career and how did you manage to get to this position? As it's not the easiest thing to be able to do in an architecture firm, and particularly one of such of a caliber of DLR. No, and I, I appreciate the the ask. It's uh it's been an amazing journey. Um, uh, yeah, I would say it started you know uh, when I got out of college. I went. I'm a Nebraska graduate. Right. Uh, with an architecture degree. I am an architect by, by trade and by mm-hmm. license. But um, I had a, a passion for the business side of architecture from really a very early uh, age. And I had um, aspirations. I, I knew that there were going to be others who uh, maybe were more gifted as designers, who had uh, more interest in the mechanics and the techniques technical skills of architecture. And I, and I've gone through all of those phases. I've told people I've, I've probably held every role in this company through the years, but my real passion has been the business side. And uh, I've done a lot of business development. I've done a lot of strategic planning and I don't know, I just kind of set my sights on, can I, can I have an impact on some business um, with that, with that personal passion of Mm. being under uh, really, being around the built environment. I, I, I loved architecture in high school. I loved, you know, the old look up. Um, I'm always fascinated by how the built environment impacts each one of us in different ways. And so, you know, that's what got me, drew me into the profession of architecture was just that um, curiosity um, mm-hmm. about that. But um, I, I worked, uh, started to work for DLR Group. It wasn't DLR Group at the time. It was this uh, uh, smaller 180 uh, person firm that had grown to two or three locations out of Omaha, Nebraska, right. uh, that grew up into uh, Pierre, South Dakota and Lewiston, Idaho, and a number of places where the firm had made some investment in, in, in housing uh, for the Native Americans. And that was really our, our very beginning. But anyway, it was a, it was a fairly small uh, firm, um, but a firm that was handing out opportunities um, to young people. And uh, 
you know, as fate would have it, I joined the LR group in 1980, um, in the, in the, at the throes of a recession. And, uh, I think I was one of two people hired that year. And so I felt very fortunate to find a job much less with this firm that I, I knew of. And I actually, yeah. I had, I had been in their offices in high school as part of a explorer post with Amazing. the boy scouts. And so, I knew a little bit about them. Uh, I had a family friend that was actually an executive in another firm mm. that I could always um, ask about the profession. But um, anyway, I um, went to school and, and actually interned with the R Group in Farmington, New Mexico. And then uh, as a result of that internship, they invited me to full-time employment when I graduated in, in 1980. Um, you know, I, and, and I, you, so you've never worked anywhere else? This has been my only family. That's my amazing. Only family. Now that, uh, that that's extraordinary. That's forty-one 40, years. Forty-one in... years in May. And um, congratulations. And it, thank you. Thank you. And there's a lot of whys behind that. And I, I, uh, you know, part of my story is going to be one of exploring opportunities. And it seems mm. like every time I had an interest, um, all I had to do was voice that to somebody. Um, and there was always a. Uh, we all have mentors, right? We all have people in our firms, whether they're principals or others who kind of look after you, they become your friend and they ask, you know, they answer, you know, your, your own curiosity. And it seems like every time I had a interest in exploring something different, another avenue of this profession in an effort to get my license, that was a very early goal of mine to become a licensed architect, whatever that meant. Mm. Um, they, they were able to do that for me. And so it was kind of ironic that I started out the very first, first, uh, moments in DLR group, uh, in business development. I didn't know anything about how business, how design was created really in the practice. And, yeah. um, I knew the, a little bit of the language. I certainly didn't know how to build, how buildings were going together. And I spent about two years doing business development, uh, in Omaha. And candidly, that was at a time where business development really wasn't a popular practice or discipline mm. inside of a lot of architecture firms. And so it was a little unnerving that, you know, my peers were going, what are you doing? Uh, you're doing business development. So I did that for uh, and what a did, few what, years. What did that entail? I, um, we, the LR group at the time was really well known for uh, public architecture. And so right. we did a lot of educational work, schools around the Midwest. Um, and so my job was to go build relationships with school districts and uh, public sector clients um, and in an effort to um, win new work. And so I would go out and establish relationships and win confidence and then pull the partners and principals and architects and designers into the conversation at the appropriate time and make the introductions in a way they would go do their thing. And then I ultimately would maintain some relationship with those clients, you know, as the project was um, underway, you know, I could mm -hmm. keep, keep see what I could see what was happening, what was being developed and, you know, developing uh, an understanding of the language of, of service and start watching service delivery. But um, it really had nothing to do with the uh, preparation of design and preparation of architecture. And, and, and that was one of those moments about two years into it, I finally said, Hey gang, I need to be an architect and I need to work for an architect and I, I, I want to be licensed and I need to dive into it. And um, there was an opening in, in those days in a design department inside the LR group. And I, I said, I'd like to apply for that. And they, 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 <laughs> they let me apply for it. Um, and so I had to competitively, uh, you know, compete for this, this position that was vacated by a, a rock star, candidly. And, um, and they gave me the position. So I, off, I went in working in design and I had a senior design leader, a principal that I was working with yeah. and really began to understand how buildings went together and understand the language of education and, and, and programming and planning and schematic, all the, all the, the disciplines, um, and I did that for two or three years. And um, I think like everybody, you get a little itchy. I, in, my own, in my own case, I was a little concerned that Omaha, Nebraska was going to be a little sleepy Midwestern town, yeah. which it's not, by the way. But it, at the time, it seemed like it was. And so I was kind of looking for another frontier. That's all I'd kind of known was Omaha, Nebraska. And, and a, a DLR group had, um, we were responding to opportunities out in the, the in, color, in Utah and in the Intermountain area with uh, oil exploration, uh, oil right. shale that was booming, beginning to boom out there. And behind that was coming a need for all public architecture schools. And so 
Um, I just basically put my name in the hat when they were building a, an office in Salt Lake City or considering uh, going to Salt Lake City and said, you're going to need somebody <laughs> to do business development and who understands how schools go together. And I had been working with a principal to do some work out in Vernal, Utah. And uh, they said, geez, if you're interested, um, how about you go to Utah? Well, six weeks later, um, I, was, you are. I, I was a <laughs> one month old baby and, uh, you know, uh, I'd been married a few years. Uh, there I was in Salt Lake City, Utah, uh, helping to build and grow a, a practice in Salt Lake. And um, there also, I took on project management skills. I took on right. project architecture skills, learned all of that, got my license um, in, in Utah. And so it was very a, a formative set of years that I spent there and mm. um, loved it out there. We, we love the outdoors, love the community, but you know, like every community um, they went on hard times too, when um, oil shale um, production went drastically down and right. uh, the ener energy embargoes of the time. And so the economy went a little bit South there. And, you know, like every architect you go, gosh, I don't know if this is for me. Then you start poking around looking for maybe other opportunities. And uh, one day, one of the managing principals, uh, co-CEOs came and came to the office. Does anybody want to have dinner tonight? I was just curious and nobody wanted to go. <laughs> and I, and I said to Bryce Pearsall, who at the time was a managing principal, I said, Bryce, I'll go to dinner with you. So I called my wife, said, I'm not coming for dinner. I'm going to have dinner with the managing principal. And he asked me how things were going. And I said, Bryce, you know, you and I can probably agree on one thing. I said, I, I can probably make you $500,000 in fees a year um, in this economy. Maybe we get to a million, but my suspicion is that's not going to make you happy. And candidly, it's not going to make me happy either. Yeah. So we had a, a short dinner conversation, but the fact that he would ask how I was doing was kind of a, a aha moment for me in leadership also. And I've told that story many times, but long story short, about two months later, I found myself, uh, I had some choices to go to Seattle or Minneapolis. And they said, we're opening an office in Minneapolis as a result of some success we're having in the upper Midwest. Right. Uh, would you like to go open your own office in Minneapolis? And you know, what architect at 30 years old doesn't want to open their own office? And uh, so I did so. I, I loaded up the family and we all went to Minneapolis and uh, opened an office, me, myself and I. And I was joined by a, a partner from Omaha to um, really lead the production side of the office. And I was leading the strategic uh, and marketing side of the office. And uh, anyway, his wife was in business development. And so we had a pretty good team. And long story short, we built um, an office there um, in five, five years to 70 people. Um, wow. with architecture, mechanical, electrical, and structural services. Um, we were out in Eden Prairie. We built our own office building. And um, it was a great run. It was probably the most fun I've ever had in business was looking over the horizon, building a practice. And, you know, I – you do that because the opportunity was there, not because you knew how to do it all. And so yes. you learned, you learned how to hire people, manage people, write proposals, negotiate contracts and all those things. All of a sudden I'd go home every night and you know, there's a certain fear that sets in. You've, you've got an expectation. Hey, I've got to show my family and my peers that I'm uh, able to do this. Um, there was a certain drive um, I had because, you know, Again, I was kind of running my own business yeah. with the backstop and resource of DLR Group, which was comforting. But in those days, was you know a day's drive away and uh, mm. or a FedEx overnight. It wasn't like this where I could have these <laughs> daily conversations. And um, so I became uh, a principal. Uh, not too many years after that all happened, and um, as a result of the successes we were having there, and. Um, ultimately became part of a knowledge sharing community we call forums. Right. Um, and I had grown a, grown a specific expertise in doing public K-12 architecture. And so I was part of a national knowledge community and, um, and then involved in leading one of our forums and which was kind of a, a, a test to see how I might be able to lead and, and play in a sandbox collaboratively with others around DLR group. And there were other people like me growing in other, you know, in Seattle's and Kansas cities and Chicago. And so, you know, I was getting to know my peers at that point in time, uh, virtually, mm. uh, by phone. Um, I think email showed up a little bit later, but, um, the bottom line is, is that, at some point in time, the managing principals also thought enough of, you know, what I was trying to accomplish and 
uh, and what I was accomplishing to make me a senior principal. And so right. I became, you know, one, part of the first class of senior principals. There were five of us. We were also an advisors to the board, which was Bryce and Dale at the point in time. And so we were exposed to, I was probably the youngest guy. No, I was the youngest guy in the room, but I was exposed to a lot of our business at that mm. point um, in the early nineties. And um Still had a lot of energy, and um, it wasn't too many years after that where even Bryce and Dale had said, you know, we need to make sure that we are establishing um, a transition path, and um, they appointed John and I as uh, managing principals, principals to succeed them. That was in 2004. It was also coincidentally the same year we 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 uh, flipped to ESOP, and we'll probably talk about that a little bit more. But right. uh, we became 100% ESOP at that point in time. So in 2004, John and I kind of jumped into the co-pilot seat with uh, Bryce and Dale running the company, and we did that for a number of years, and, um, and until about 2008 or nine, um, remember the exact dates. You know, the pilot the seat switched. Right. But it was a, you know, I think this is a great lesson. You know, transition takes time. It's those transitions that, you know, are a flip of the switch that become very disruptive to a company. Yeah. And and that was not the case at all. We were kind of, we were kind of sl- slowly kind of slipped into this pilot seat. Yeah. When you first joined the practice, um, had there been a transition prior to that? What was, what, how long had the practice been going before you joined um, well, Bryce and Dale were uh, the managing principals uh, as long as I can remember. Um, right. I was hired by the original founder, Irv Dana. Right. And um, in the mid 80s, when I was out in Utah, there was also a transition that happened with uh, Dana Larson at Rubel. Right. Um, and they transitioned to Bryce and Dale. Got it. And uh, Jim Rubel was the constant in that. Irv chose to step aside uh, fairly quickly, and uh, so did Bill Larson. But um, Jim Rubel and Bryce and Dale ran that company together. Um, and, you know, Jim stayed very, very actively involved for a number of years. And again, if, if I look back in history, you know, it was very, very calculated as you look back at it. Uh, Jim hung on, and, and still to this day, he's not with the other group, but he's working and very creative uh, person and a mentor to, to me still. Um, but, uh, ultimately he let go and Bryce and Dale took on, um, the, the, the challenge and the, a big growth spurt for DLR group. And, mm. and then John and I jumped in the saddle, as I said, back in 2004, 2005 and practice alongside Bryce and Dale for five years before it was our turn. Right. Okay. And, so there was um, a, a and, nice period of transition essentially. Yeah. It was, it was a, you know, literally about 10 years before, um, Bryce retired and uh, Dale stayed on and, and uh, worked as a, uh, as a board member and our board chair for a number of years. And um, John and I uh, were partners until 2013 and John um, passed away. Um, I wouldn't say suddenly, we knew this was mm. coming. He had cancer right. and um, went through a period of time where he was working remotely and um, doing the best he could. I was filling mm. a lot of blanks in terms of traveling to the various offices and helping with growth. But um, ultimately, John passed away. And at that moment in time, the board of directors said, you know, they, we took that tragedy mm. as a moment to really look at our future. And um, John and I had essentially been co-CEOs yeah. together and we had divided the company responsibilities and in some ways kind of created two different companies, which was also part of the problem. And yes. the board decided to uh, change governance to a CEO structure in 2013. And um, so I've been formally in that role since 2013 until today. Um, and it's uh, it's been an amazing ride. Uh, you know, Incredible. it's Yeah. You were, you were t- discussing there about how there was essentially, in some ways, two bi- two different businesses. Um, could you explain a little bit about what the current structure of the DLR group is, how it looks, how many different offices you've got um, yeah. naturally, um, and then how you guys kind of started to reintegrate it, if you like? That's yeah. an interesting thing that many practices I've, I've spoken to, particularly larger corporate yeah, organizations. We, let me just start briefly with what, with what was happening, which... Yeah fueled the change is that, you know, we were a growing company, very, very growing, very rapidly. And yet we also needed to make sure that we weren't always treading over the top of each other. And so 
we divided responsibilities by market sector and by operational regions. And so I was responsible for education, higher education. John was responsible for workplace and criminal justice work. Uh, He was responsible for the West Coast offices. I was responsible for East and Central. And um, that all looks good on a piece of paper until, you know, the strategic plan I've got for growth of education, higher education or K-12 affected one of the offices that he was going to be a part of and go, no, I don't think that is going to work. And all of a sudden the strategy, we had our, we were our own roadblocks. Mm. And so um, we had, we had already talked that this was going to be something we were going to have to try to address. And, um, and so when we changed governance, um, we kept the regions, but, you know, we have global sector leaders now that are responsible for, and I'll use K-12 as an example. We have a person that's responsible for working with the knowledge community of regional sector leaders to grow the K-12 sector. Um, no, we, are, we aren't competing against ourselves anymore. And so, you know, our K-12, our sector leaders work with all of our offices and there's 27 of them in the U.S. Right. Um, We'll work with all of our offices to implement a strategic plan to grow K-12 or grow higher. We have a higher education group. We have 11, you know, 10 core sectors. And, um, and so we've got people that are responsible for developing annual business plans with these knowledge communities that are, that are made up of representatives from many of those operational regions or offices. And so Mm. it truly has become a national practice. And, um, you know, my role has shifted from being involved, you know, or responsible for any one sector to working strategically with all of our global sector leaders. And then we also, you know, added a chief operating officer to the mix who would deal with the day-to-day operations and the business of architecture with each one of our operating regions as well. And we have, uh, I think, eight operating regions in the U.S. Right. And, um, and then two international regions, one in China and one in the Middle East. Right. And so he's in day-to-day contact with the leadership of those operating units. Um, and it's, a, it's very much a matrix organization so that our sectors kind of in, intersect with the operating units. And, you know, there's a lot of check and balance in place. There's a lot of um, ability for us to balance staff that way. Mm-hmm. I spend most of my time looking out over the next horizon rather than trying to, excuse me, deal with the day-to-day operations of the business. Um, I try to cultivate uh, new opportunities and cul- cultivate the creative ideas that are generated once in a while and uh, make sure I'm, I'm uh, of uh, leadership and management support to those uh, strategic efforts. And and how has your role evolved? You said you mentioned there that you had you implemented a uh, chief operating officer. Um, how does your role differentiate from from that role as the CEO? And you kind of started to answer that a little bit. What you would, how you would describe? Yeah, it. Um, generally, if I, if I look at you know prime responsibilities, um, I I'm probably more involved in the strategic um, uh, direction of the company and looking forward. Mm-hmm. Um, where I, I have a concern clearly about what's happening today, but Charles is more uh, involved in uh, how the work is being executed and are we, are we generating the revenue streams that we need to meet our projections, et cetera, and how we get that done. You know, looking over the horizon is my job. And, um, and so, and then we have a, an intersection of those beliefs at an executive team, which in, in I also established um I really felt strongly that there needs to be a small group of people that I can work with collaboratively to understand essentially every operation of what's happening inside the other group, not down to the project level necessarily, but mm. um, so Charles is part of our executive team. Our CFO is part of our executive team, which you know really understands the finances and the e- part of the ESOP, et cetera. We have a ch- chief marketing officer that's responsible for all of the marketing systems and practices that... Um, I'm aware of, again, he's responsible for all of those. We have a chief information officer that's really responsible for all of our technologies and technology development and a CHRO responsible for HR systems and practices and a global design leader that is also not responsible for all of our design, but the language of design and the consistency of design inside DLR group. 
and then uh, an engineering leader that really is responsible for engineering delivery around the company, and then an interiors leader that's responsible for um, how we integrate interiors into our practices globally as well. And so that group of people, we meet virtually like this every two weeks um, to, again, sometimes it's a share, sometimes it's a uh, what's going on in, in your world. I really mm-hmm. feel strongly that with distributed leadership, we all need to have be able to have the answer. If you're sitting on the executive team, you ought to really never be have to say, I don't know. Let me find out. We try to get our executive team to a point where they know a little bit about everything that's happening in the company so they can support it. They can, you know, how does, how does HR play into the, into the strategic plan that we have? How does finance, how does technology, how does engineering? Um, So it's, it's a great melting pot for ideas that we meet every two weeks. And, um, and then of, of course there's a board of directors that, you know, I report to that ultimately says, as long as we're growing, as long as we're not doing things um, immoral at the executive team level or for firm management, they're, they're really involved in um, maintaining a fiduciary responsibility for the company. And so, and there are, there are four of us at the management principal level that are also on the board too. So there's a big continuity between the operations of the company, the strategy of the company and the board of directors. So, Got it. And, and I suppose this, this kind of leads into the, like the, the company structure as being employee owned, the ESOP vehicle and how that, how that differs. What is, what is an ESOP um, and how it differs from the kind of, you know, the traditional having an owner or having partners who have ownership in the business. Yeah. And does that still happen? You guys, everybody has partners have majority stakeholder shares or. No, it doesn't. I think, uh, you know, we, uh, the the employee stock ownership has been, or let's just start with employee ownership has been part of the value system of DLR group and Dana Larson rule as it started from the very beginning, from the the late 1960s, early 1970s, her bill and Jim all started to offer ownership uh, in those days to some of the very first partners and employees of the company. This was before ESOP even showed up. And then ESOP legislation showed up the, the form ESOP legislation allowing ESOPs happened up in the 70s. And we became one of the first service companies in the in the country to uh, at least adopt a partial ESOP. And so uh, we were a partial ESOP for many, many years until 2004, when we became 100% employee owned. Um, and, you know, to answer your question, our ownership structure is very flat. We have today out of 1,150 employees, we have just over 800 shareholders. Um, Anybody who comes to work at DLR Group with a 401k plan can buy stock at any time uh, during our stock exchange, which happens once a year. Um, We have, um, again, you, 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 there is no one that's a majority shareholder. Uh, I think our biggest shareholder is about four and a half percent of the value of the company. And that's, an exception to the rule uh, because there, it's very flat beyond that. And so, you know, probably the fundamental difference between ourselves and uh, other companies that have ownership is that our compensation is in no way, shape or form directly tied to the number of shares that we own. Um, it's not at all. Uh, in fact, via an ESOP, we can't, we can't compensate pay people based on, on what they own, or we'd have to do it equitably across the entire firm to do that. So, yeah. um, and so we have um, a pr- an appointment system where our senior associates are required to own a certain amount of stock, 401k, I'll get that in a minute, our certain amount of stock, our principals own a certain amount of stock. So we still have these equity requirements for elevation and appointment to new, we'll call them promotions in the company. But probably the unique thing about our ESOP is it's held inside a 401k plan. Right. Um, and so all of the equity uh, in our firm is shared inside the 401k. So anybody with a 401k account, which for those of you in the UK, I don't know if you know that, but our 401k is a, is a retirement plan essentially offered in the US. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so p- employees can put money away tax-free in that. Yeah, access then, as a tax wrapper, right? Exactly. It's tax-free and it grows tax-free until such time that you touch it someday. So, you know, the first decision people have to make is, am I going to save for my future? And the second decision they have to make at DLR Group is, do they want to save and invest in the company that you you do have an influence and uh, in, in its performance. And um, 
you know, I think part of my challenge is that we are an employee owned company. And I think I, I would also say ESOP has become a deep, deep part of our culture. Employee ownership is one of our core values. Um, and so um, I am often asked about decisions that we make. How will this impact our stock value? There are some days I feel like a public tra traded company because there is an expectation that we're going to have value growth. Um, it's a deferred compensation plan that people put their investment and trust in. Mm. And um, I take that very seriously. Yeah. Um, I continue to buy stock too. And uh, not because it's just a good value, because it's I, I believe in where we're going. And uh, I think people that do buy stock uh, have that exact same feeling. And it's, it's fun to see uh, new people invest in the company, have faith in where we're going. It's a big vote of confidence from my perspective that we're heading in the right directions. And we have a stock sale once a year. Um, and I spend uh, about two months ahead of that time just reminding people, for those who are new, educating them about how the 401k works, how the stock plan works, um, and reminding them about what our compensation structure is all about, too. And I think the other, the other beauty of the ESOP and how it sits, mm. it's an S, it's an S, we're an S corporation that sits inside the ESOP. And so right. all the earnings of the company pass through the ESOP, which in the U.S., uh, makes those earnings tax exempt until um, you're ultimately they're passed on to the shareholders, which is the ESOP. And so essentially you're tax exempt until you touch those someday. So we are not required to, and the other fundamental difference by, in a lot of firms is we don't, we're not required to empty the bank account every year for tax right. purposes. We can retain cash. And so our compensation plan sets out a, a strategy to do just that because part of the, the responsibility of an ESOP is to make sure that there's funds available down the road to be able to pay for that stock as people retire. And, right. um, and so that's something we tell people very early on and remind people that yes, while we've had good years, we're putting, you know, half of that away for a rainy day uh, and, or for our future stock obligations. And that is a discipline that has been bred into me by generations of leaders. And it's a discipline that I'm breeding into the next generation of leaders. And um, I think we've, we've got a really great flywheel effect happening right now where people come into the organization, they're buying stock, they stay with the company, they're here, you know, X number of years, they retire with the company, there are people selling stock, guess what, next year, there are people coming back in to buy that very same stock. And so, there's this uh, kind of a constant transfer mm. of, of ownership inside DLR Group. And I, as you well know, sometimes that moment in time for some firms is a backbreaker. Yeah. Some group of people have to go to the bank to borrow money to pay Charlie mm. and his partners, and they may never recover from that. And that just doesn't happen here. It hasn't happened here for, <laughs> gosh, 20 years, you know, when we formed the ESOP. And um, it really is uh, embedded in our culture and we share our, our stock value success every year and as frequently as anybody wants to talk about it. But I think in um, since 1986, uh, we've had one year where our stock value has lost 1% in value, one right. year. And that was right after the 2009 uh, uh, really rough wow. recession the, the, the world went through. Yeah. And, and since then, it's outperforming a lot of the uh, stock markets right now. So, yeah. how, how, how does this impact the, the culture of the team? Uh, or, or the kind of responsibility that people kind of feel they have now that they, you know, they've got they own part of the business, essentially? Well, and again, we're very transparent with with our with our financials. The only thing we don't share with people is compensation. I still think that can be a very uh, uh, a very uh, problematic conversation for a lot of people. And so we we don't share compensation, but we share everything else. You know where the revenue streams are coming from, where they're not coming in from, and should be. Right. What our profit structure is looking like. We decide together where we're going to make investments through our annual business planning. Um, I can assure you that as we go through all of those, uh, and we share financials with every human being in DLR group every month, the good, the bad, and the ugly, <laughs> and um, they have an understanding um, of their impact, of the levers they're pulling, and how they uh, impact potentially the stock value. We're, we're very transparent about how our stock is valued, yeah. and you know, 
consistency of revenue, our projections, that the promises we make to each other uh, in terms of our projections, the markets, the investments that we're going to make, the new firms that join us, we share all of that with our employees. And so really by mid-summer, people are going to get a good feel for how the year is going to end. And we share our EBITDA monthly yep. uh, profit. And uh, you know, it took a little while to explain to people what EBITDA is all about, but that's our currency. And anybody that works for DLR Group longer than a year understands that. Do, would you like to explain for, for listeners who don't understand what EBITDA is? Earnings before interest, taxes, uh, depreciation. <clears throat> so it's a, it's a, a way accounting. of valuing. Yep, exactly. Um, and uh, it's, a, it's a pretty common um, uh, financial metric here in the US. I've done a, a couple of things with some firms in the UK and you, you keep track of things differently there. We, we use but, EBITDA as well. Some of the accountants, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've spoken of accountants who value businesses and yep. they, they do that as well. I, my accounting department always says, it's the, I always say it to, a, to an employee, it's the same as profit, but it's really not, I get it. But, but yeah. we're valued in part based on EBITDA. We're valued in part based on our net service revenue and in part how the rest of the build, the industry is doing. And so, um, we're very transparent about that. And we've mm. got a, a compensation plan that, you know, distributes 401k funds back to employees based on our EBITDA. And so they know the more we earn, the more they get. And, um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it works both ways. Got so, it. So, so all the, all the stocks that employees own of the business, it's not like they get paid dividends, um, right. kind of monthly that, that goes back into their 401k plans, basically. So, so it's all, all for future investment or for their, their pensions. Right. Yeah, we've elected not to pay dividends. We could do that, but it's unfortunately dividend structure is paid out based on earnings. Right. And, uh, okay. and so we just we've really been opposed to a, any plan that kind of enables the rich to get richer. Yes. So um, our four hundred one k fund is uh, I don't mind telling people we distribute eight percent of our EBITDA to our employees. Right. Um, equitably. So if we have eligible employees, a thousand eligible employees. Mm-hmm. Every employee gets the exact same amount. I get the same amount as my assistant. And um, then they can turn around and use those 401k funds to purchase stock if they like, or they can buy any other uh, 401k investment strategy they, or investment um, inside our program. So we don't tell them they have to buy stock. We just create an, av- an opportunity for them to do so. Got it. And so people basically, they could, they could choose to use their salaries, if you like, to buy, to invest into more stock if they wanted to. And yeah. if, they didn't, if they didn't want to buy any stock, they would be able to do that. They could. That's correct. It, it's, yeah. it's totally voluntary. And it's, um, it's also, as I said, we have some appointments. So as people become senior associates and licensed and people become principals, they, there are escalating minimum expectations and they use their 401k to, to, to buy stock using their 401k funds. We give people five years to do that so they can still make other investments and not have to invest totally in DLR group. I would never recommend that either. But um, at, there are some of us that are more heavily invested in DLR Group than we probably any financial planner would uh, suggest we do. But, but, um, but I do think you know that's a decision we give to every employee. Yeah. And, um, yeah. How um, do you think this is going to be a more popular method of ownership in the industry? Well, I can say that you know the people we recruit are really intrigued about the opportunity for ownership and. I think there are a lot of people that in this industry that I think go to work for firms with the idea that maybe someday they will be an owner. Mm. Maybe, maybe not a principal level, but how do I get to have some ownership? And I think there's been, um, I think you know, people at every level of the company, engineers, architects, administrative staff, uh, uh, marketing staff, et cetera, all have the same opportunity to buy stock and benefit from it, uh, which is a little bit different than other firms also. I think it's a real recruiting opportunity for us and, and the means in which we have available for people to buy the stock. Nobody has to go to the bank anymore to borrow, to borrow the funds, um, which I had to do under an old DLR group in order to become a partner. And uh, it, it was uh, a little more stressful, you know, in those days, this is an easy plan, but I, I think the whole idea that an employee can be part of a team and together they can see the impact of the decisions they make, mm. whether it's the contract they sign, the spec they write, the lines they draw, the number of iterations of design they deliver, all has an impact on project profitability, which ultimately has an impact on firm profitability, which ultimately has an impact on stock. I think everybody 
can see that it's it's tangible and um i think that's a real advantage mm-hmm. uh i i think people have have taken it's it's embedded in our culture and i've said that before esop is not just a transaction and there are so many firms in the company in the in the in the us that are using esop as a means to transfer ownership which is good the real test is the stand, is the test of time is can yeah. you really embrace the culture of esop as much as the transaction of esop and so I think we've done a good job of that over 40 years of it. And uh, it is, I can't imagine not being employee owned. How about that? <laughs> is there criteria that um, say new employees that they have to fulfill before they're eligible to be able to purchase um, you know, stock options? In, in our case, no, um, they have to have a 401k account and, and that's we it. make sure that they enroll in one of those, the day they, they start, but they may come from another company with another retirement plan. They can roll their funds into the 401k. And like I said, our stock exchange happens just once a year. And so they have to buy stock during that, that year, that period of time, just right. after our new, our new value has, has been announced. We celebrate that with champagne and uh, every year. And uh, then the stock exchange open and they can buy stock, but there is no, no limit on who can own stock. You have to have a 401k plan. That's the only thing. Got it. And what happens when people want to, when people leave, they just sell the, sell it back to the company if they don't want to retain it or are they, are they able to retain it if they're not an employee? No, you're um, by law. Um, you must be an employee of DLR group to keep right. stock. We don't have any outside or silent shareholders and that's a, a, a rule of our ESOP. Yep. Um, and so when people leave, they have to sell their stock and uh, I won't get into a lot of details, but they can either sell in, in some cases for the most cases for the current value of the stock, or they can, if they choose, hold and accept the next value of the stock. And that's just a rule right. that, you know, we, that we don't control the ESOP rules to do that. So, but we do cash them out. And uh, depending on how much they're, how much they have on the table, we may have a, re- we have a repayment plan so that we don't necessarily, you know, get caught with a big cash outlay, but, but it's um, no, they have to sell their stock. Brilliant. It's absolutely fascinating. And I can see why it's such a powerful structure uh, for a business to to be operating in. And the kind of the buy-in that you get from the team and the community that it develops, that's really the, I can see that's the kind of a, the, one of the big powers behind it, if you like. Like you were saying, the, the culture of the ESOP is, you know, is one of the most cru- crucial parts of it. It's a big part of it, and it's and it is a part, and it's weaves because it's a core value ownership. It weaves it into everything we do, all the decisions we make, and you know we've it, we kind of test it when we're hiring employees. Um, you know, the more senior, the more we test the the firms that joined us through acquisition. I, we really want people to have a sense of and an, and an interest in reinvesting mm. in the new company. And so all of our acquisitions have done that. Every one of them have reinvested in DLR Group, you know, as I would call it a condition of joining us. Fantastic. And um, I'd like to talk a little bit about your experience as the chair of the LFRT. Yeah. What is the LFRT? Well, the Larcher Roundtable um, was established in the 80s, and um, I'm very privileged to be a recent chair uh, just this year. I've been a part of the LFRT for about eight years, and um, it consists of 60 of the largest firms in the U.S. Um, it's by application. Um, it's roughly... Um, uh, of those firms that are part of us, we represent about 200,000 architects uh, around the industry. We represent about $40 billion in design service revenues. Um, it is a group of people that work in a very collaborative environment to address the needs of the industry and specifically those um, that might be unique to large firms. Our large firms are our firms with 160 AIA members, uh, in most cases, I think our minimum size is about, we have about 300 people right. in a firm. Uh, they go up to 40,000. Those are rare, but uh, you know, the, the vast an, majority. An ACOM type. Practice. Yeah, exactly. They're part of our, our, our team too, and the Stantex and yep. Um, yep. Large, large firms. The vast majority of our firms are in that 500 to 1500 employees. 
Um, and, you know, there are unique things that we feel that we have um, in our own industries, um, in the large firms that, you know, realizing that American Institute Architects is a big organization, but predominantly its membership is small practitioners. And uh, there's actually a small firm roundtable too, um, but, you know, less than 10 people. And some of the issues we face are just different. Uh, yeah. And so it was formed to try to address those contracted contract issues, HR issues, IT issues, innovation issues. Um, those are all things we worked out about together. I mean, last March, is a great example of the LFRT came together and we were meeting LR every six weeks, um, which we usually just meet twice a year. Um, we were meeting every six weeks to compare notes of how we were all managing our way through COVID. Right. What, what were best practices? And I was blown away at how open, you know, every firm was there. Our, our best attendance has happened because I think we were all in this game together, right? And um, I, I think the LFRT also functions on this simple premise that the more we share in the old, the old adage that uh, a rising tide floats all boats higher too. Yeah. Um, I think if we can tackle certain issues together and be real collegial about it, we're all going to benefit from that. And candidly, how we were addressing work from home, virtual workforce, contract starts and stops, COVID, are we work closing offices? Who's, who's opening offices? Um, you know, what are you seeing? How are you responding to COVID outbreaks in your office? I mean, that was so helpful. And I think that event probably brought the LFRT together like it's never been before. Wow. We also um, assemble periodically. We had a, a strategic planning session for what we really wanted to put our arms around about a year ago. Um, and we put our arms around, you know, three real crucial topics, um, certainly changing the, the language of architecture and educating uh, a future workforce, getting ourselves out into academia and candidly the high schools and junior high schools to promote architecture as a STEM program. And um, uh, that's a big deal. And that, you know, what's, what's come out of that also is a real focus we have to pull uh, minorities um, into our profession as well. Yeah. Um, it's not well represented, as you know. And so we've developed partnerships with NOMA. We've developed partnerships with the HBCU uh, institutions, predominantly black college universities yeah. to make a, do a better effort at helping mentor and guide and bring those students out into the profession. And so that was one big focus. Another big focus that we, that we uh, have come up with is, you know, this whole industry is evolving as we speak. Yeah. Uh, it's a changing practice. And, you know, fundamentally we haven't changed what we do, you know, our design, schematic design, design development, correct production documents for, centuries. Um, the pace of all that's really picking up and the infiltration of technology to help us do it better is really helping us as well. And, and so we've got a CIO subcommittee that's also helping us explore, you know, efficiencies and can we explore those together? Can we do some research together? Can we uh, capture new efficiencies together without giving away our corporate secrets? And, um, you know, how we, you know, how we do research together and comparing notes and how, how we pull academia, how we pull Silicon Valley into the conversations and doing that together as a group. I mean, part of that resulted in a tour of Silicon Valley with a couple of futurists out there, which really, you know, illuminated the future for many of us. And um, again, we're doing that together. Um, and the last thing we're, we're doing is uh, really uh, environmental stewardship. And um, most of the firms have were initial signatures to the Architecture 2030 uh, commitment. I don't know whether you're familiar with that in Ed, Ed Masria. Um, we really are committed to climate change in this notion is that we need to do some tangible things mm. to change what we're doing, to change the products uh, that we're putting in place, to change our buildings, to make a more res resilient future. And can we, can we hold ourselves accountable for acting a certain way, for performing buildings in a certain way? Can we yep. publish the results of our design work to each other in a little quasi competitive environment? And the answer is yes. And so it's a small group of people that um, are, until COVID hit, you know, are, we were meeting face to face twice a year. And I think you build trust with people that way. You build relationships. We have firms that are working with each other uh, on projects. 
Um, there is this, um, there is a little spirit of competition. We source, we can't talk about fees. Uh, we don't talk about fees, but boy, about everything else is on the table. We have a survey that we we're just doing right now. That is a benchmarking survey that we try to get. We have about 40 of the 60 participate in and we get the results back and it benchmarks as marks each firm against the rest of the LFRT without divulging everybody else's information. So it's confidential. Right except I see DLR group against the rest of the LFRT. And so it does let you kind of get a feel for how we, how we stack up, what our best practices are doing in comparison to, the, to our competition in some yep. cases, but LFRT has been a, a, a very rewarding and learning experience. When you, when you pack a room with 55 Amazing. CEOs of the largest firms in the world and have a spirited strategic conversation, that's fun. That is, you, you, you cannot come, not come away with something every time. Fantastic. We meet. Amazing. Yeah. I mean, that sounds, that sounds like some seriously exciting conversations to be, to be having. It is, it is particularly with the pace of change we're dealing with um, and the focus we have now on, uh, on bringing minorities into practice on the environment, on, on the change of technology, uh, changing the, the dialogue about what architecture mm. is all about and the opportunity of design, of a di- design career. It's been a, uh, a, f- a rapid uh, paced profession. In fact, we've, we've moved to four times a year rather than twice because the, the profession is changing so quickly. And it's, that's a good thing. How do you, um, we were talking earlier about business development and you were saying when you, when you first joined the DLR group, that was one of your main roles was to be going out and, and establishing those relationships. How's, right. how's your business development role evolved from then to now? And mm. and also interested, you know, with your experience with the with the LFRT, how are other practices engaging in business development? You know, and that's another place where there's a big diversity uh, of how business development is done. And and I think it starts with maybe the top of that heap is we all build relationships one way, shape, or other. Yeah. There are some firms that uh, are really heavily weighted on what I'd call a seller doer model, where they may have principals or partners who do the bulk of relationship building and do the bulk of business development as a result, and um, you know have very little dedicated business development staff. Um, and that I can't, I, that's not bad. It, everybody's got their own thing. Yeah. You know, we started years ago having business development become a separate discipline inside DLR group, uh, for this purpose. And that we wanted to go out and build as many relationships as we possibly can without pulling our design professionals out of the important work of design too soon. Um, I think if you, if you look across the industry, and I'm, I'm not going to say across the LFRT, but across the industry, there are so many examples of firms that have to drop everything to go business develop, do business development and find new opportunities. Then they land work and then their revenue streams drop. And then they do it again. And they have this real kind of a roller coaster of a revenue stream. And our business development was put in place to try to flatten that curve. And yeah. so we can have a more consistent revenue stream, uh, always looking at new opportunities, also always you know, trying to build on existing opportunities. Um, we st- certainly thrive on repeat work just like every other firms because you know, that's the least expensive form of business development there is just to make people happy and keep doing it. But um, we've got a, a staff of dedicated business developers that are also very market focused. And so right. we've got people that are, you know, getting to know real, uh, people in higher education communities, people that are getting to know K-12 communities. Um, you know, it, it does seem like it's really important to be able to speak the right language of, you know, someone that um, is interested in developing a 300 room hotel in the Las Vegas strip probably doesn't want to hear about the last K-12 school you did in, in Phoenix. And so we've developed a, um, a very, I, I'd say, uh, focused group of people to do that. But um, I think there is also a very delicate balance that we create and responsibility that we ask our design professionals to make sure, don't, don't think the BD person is going to bring you the next work. You know, you always have to be looking for that as well. And so there's kind of this two-pronged approach to this business development that we really rely on. But business development professionals are a big part of it. Right. Did you ever find that you have some of your design team wanting to be involved in business development and they're like, actually, I want to, I want to, and does that, does the, does the ESOP culture actually encourage that? So people might be bringing you opportunities and bringing in opportunities because they're like, well, we've met these. Well, 
Yeah, I, I'd have to say there's some there's countless examples of of people who have said I really like to do business development for a uh, passion. Um, we do have design people that are involved in business development too. We also have business developers that haven't haven't they're not they haven't been part of the architecture profession at all and just right. like me enjoyed the built environment, want to learn the basic language, but they can't or they're not licensed or don't have the skill set to do the design work. And so, you know, my message to everyone in DR group is the opportunities are endless. Look around, follow your passion and whatever your passion is, it's kind of like yours, you know, when you decided to start this series, you had a passion to do this. And, you know, when you have a passion for something, you'll be great at it. Yeah. And so, you know, if we have people um, in my own career, I had a passion for the business side of this. I knew that if I could just stay focused on the business side of this, on the business development side of this, on the client relationship side of this, I could hire people that were much better designers who were much better architectural technicians. And that was their passion. And boy, when you combine those kinds of people that have passions for different pieces of the industry, you have magic. And um, that's what we do. And so I, our CMO, I always like to tell this story, our chief marketing officer, he's, a, he's not an architect. Uh, he started in the back room running blueprints. Um, and literally in the mail room of our Omaha uh, office, nice. and he's, I don't know, he's about 10 years younger than I am, but you know, he grew up and wanted to do business development and he was a partner that helped grow our Kansas city practice. One of three that said, we'll start an office in Kansas city. And so again, we've got people that, um, when they just decide to go do something, we let them go do it. We had a, a, a person in um, Chicago who said, you know, I hear we're looking to grow K-12 uh, architecture in Charlotte. I'd like to go do that. Okay. Um, sounds like a plan. And, uh, you know, three months later, he and his family are looking for a house in Charlotte. So it's a, uh, we really encourage that kind of thinking and it goes way back to the founders working mm -hmm. with us and saying, I don't think I was ever told no. Um, we started a construction management company. We started a lead generation company, um, all because people had some crazy ideas and, uh, we just let people follow their personal passions. I love it. Well, I'm, I'm curious to know what are some of the other values of the business that, that creates such a culture like this? Hmm. Well, teamwork uh, and collaboration is a big part of our belief. I, I've said this to many people that, um, prima donnas don't last long here. Right. Um, if you're not willing to collaborate, share your knowledge, skill, uh, sharing is by the, by the way, another core value. Um, we, everyone in the company is measured by that. How do you share what you know? Mm. We, we built an intranet a few years ago, it's been 10 years ago now, um, called square one, which is our knowledge community platform that, has really blossomed and uh, we can keep track of who's, who's posting great stuff. Hey, here's a detail I learned. Here's a contract clause that we should never sign. Um, here is a great opportunity I just heard of. Here's a great speaker I just heard. Um, I suspect this will probably go up on our square one also. Um, it has really grown into being a very important part of our culture. And so Again, people that aren't ready to share with a starts with your team, right. but aren't ready to share across the group. Um, shame on them. That's really a, an important thing. And candidly, doing great design. I design really drives everything we do. Mm. And uh, if people live by our why, which is elevate the human experience by design or through design, um, you know, great things happen. And uh, that, that lives everywhere in the organization. It really does. How do you make sure that you're attracting people whose values are aligned with your company values? That's all part of our, of our uh, rec recruiting process. Um, you know, we do a lot of interviews with young staff and, and experienced staff as well. And, and, you know, sometimes the, the, an, a younger generation doesn't necessarily understand all of that, but yeah. we need to make sure that they're open to all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, but I would say, you know, it's pretty easy to see people that are, you know, 10 or 15 years into the profession and how they work. And um, we can measure that. There's some assessment tools that we use also for real key staff that come on board to make sure that they're going to be team players. And so when we, we, we hired our CIO and we hired Charles uh, as our COO and we hired Molly as our CHRO, we went through a, a long list of assessments to make sure that they were equipped to live our values. 
And, uh, and would you, would you be able some... to share what some of those assessments are? What sorts yeah, of... I wish I could tell you the name of it. I, it was a company I, I met here in Minneapolis, right. but they're, they're just assessment tools that um, basically inform us of how people think. Right. How they prefer to be communicated with, how they manage the process of sorting through information. Um, you know, do people, you know, put it all in their arms and pull it in and say, I'll do it? Yeah. Or do they look to their peer group to for a resolve? Do they think committee? Do they think do they can't make a decision without a vote? Um, they're they're a, a battery of questions. It's a, it's about a day-long assessment we do for our senior staff like that that they give us a pretty good inkling. And I would have to say they're dead on, you know, after Charles and Brooke and, and Molly joined us, they were exactly what our assessment said. And it also kind of gives us a hint where their blind sides are too. Yeah. And, and you know, everybody's got a blind side. And um, I think it really helped uh, us to um, understand what we were getting and it's worked out fabulously. So we really believe in that, that process. And again, it's, I don't want to call it a qualifying test because in most cases we've probably already made the decision to hire somebody on board before we do this. But yep. every now and then we might just might do this with two or three candidates just to kind of get a better feel for, you know, what people are telling us. Is it real? Yeah. And yeah. Uh, yeah. Great. Brilliant. And what's, uh, what's in store for the rest of 2021? Well, we're ex pretty excited about 2021. We had a record year in 2020, which, um, you know, I, I've reminded people when we bat went back to March of 20, 2020 and um, we COVID hit. I think we were all, that was the one variable in our visioning process that we never considered yeah. a worldwide epidemic, <laughs> epidemic. I mean, it's like, talk about an eye opener everybody wanted to redo our vision. And I said, no, I don't think so. Our, <laughs> our vision, our vision is what it is. And um, I think, you know, that was a good time also when we all pooled ourselves together as employee owners and recognized the challenges that were going to be in front of us, dealt with them, made some difficult decisions, but we recovered to the exact same staff load by the, that we had prior uh, COVID. We finished up with the exact same staff um, at the end of COVID, uh, you know, well, I shouldn't say at the end, at the end of our, at our fiscal year, yeah. which was halfway through COVID because we'd rebounded and we were fairly resilient that way. I was a little surprised at how well our markets for the most part were pretty resilient uh, to continue to move forward. Certainly the public markets that way, uh, hospitality of course took a, took a big hit, but even that, um, was beginning to recover, you know, in October when our fiscal year ended. So, mm. I don't know. It was uh, it was a, gr a a moment in time where when we got to the fiscal year end and we had actually pushed out more work, we'd met more, we exceeded some of our goals with the same number of people. Um, wow, did we learn how to do business differently? Yeah, I always said COVID pushed us all into the future, um, and uh, it, it candidly it did. It fast forwarded our whole approach to technology. It fast forwarded a lot of our approaches to innovation. Um, it was kind of a kick in the pants to get it going. And um, if there is a silver lining to COVID and I'm horribly sensitive to the tragedies that have occurred, but if there was a silver lining, it probably pushed us into an uncomfortable future that we've been able to wrap our arms around. Yeah, absolutely. I, I think that's, you know, being sensitive to the, the tragedies that have happened around the world regarding to COVID there is, a, like, as you say, a silver lining and it's kind of forced many businesses into new ways of, pra of, of practicing. And it's opened up a, almost like a global market much more than this, this idea of being able to collaborate as well. And with, with new different technology and with different people is suddenly available to us all. I think, I think, you know, this whole, um, you know, work from home is um, an old term that I think is losing traction. It's virtual workforce. And I, I think that's opened up our eyes to, you know, it used to be when we opened an office, you know, you would recruit people from the near proximity, 20 miles of the office. And that was really your labor pool. And if you ran out of that labor pool, boy, you were out of, out of luck. Yeah. You know, we've got people that we're hiring from all over the country who are nowhere close to an office today. And it's, um, I think virtual work has allowed us, has taught us how to work with those people remotely. And as we begin to repopulate our offices in some way, shape, or form, I'm convinced work, virtual workforce is going to be a part of that. And um, we're still trying to develop exactly what that looks like. But 
I think it's opened up some huge opportunities mm -hmm. for us to go to continue to recruit the best and brightest from places we've never been before. That's that's really interesting. I, I speak with a number of architects who are sometimes based in, in you know, places like Montana and Colorado and you know northern parts of you know in Arkansas and that's yep. more sort of central to the mountain ranges, um, where where staffing and finding labor uh, and finding team and finding talent is really difficult because they're kind of, you know, pulled out to the extremities of the U S and the metropolitan areas. Um, have, have you guys experienced that or is this new way of working virtually? This has kind of opened up a lot more talent base for you. And how do you get in contact with those sorts of people? Oh, it's a, uh, you know, again, a uh, great people in the industry kind of surface pretty easily. And, uh, you know, depending on the level of what we're looking at, right. Um, you know, the, the kind of person that we're looking for, but, you know, we have, um, software developers that are working remotely. We've got, um, business development people that are responsible for entire sectors working remotely because they're, you know, they're going to be either on a plane or on the phone all the time anyway. And, um, it's, uh, I, I think it's really opened up the opportunity for us to identify the very best people. And if they don't have to be parked in the office that we need, like to have them in, does that really matter? Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, you, we just, I would say we had a remote person in Columbus, Ohio for a year. We don't have an office in Columbus. Um, but we just said, you work with the guys in Cleveland, which is what, a couple hours away. And, um, you work with our team in Chicago, which was four hours away. I think, um, do what you have to communicate, use these tools to communicate and build team, uh, build relationships in Ohio. Long story short, um, we're going to be building an office in Columbus. And, um, <laughs> uh, as a result of that, I mean, with, without the ability to engage somebody remote to us, that might not have happened. Extraordinary. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Brilliant. That's super, really inspiring, Griff. Like absolutely wonderful to hear your expertise and your experience and uh, your contribution to DLR Group and how DLR Group has evolved. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. I think that's the perfect place for us to conclude. Well, I, I really appreciate your time and it's uh, it's an exciting time for the profession. And as I said, when we were talking about LFRT, I think, um, anything we can do to share ideas like this uh, across the profession is just going to make us all better. And uh, from my perspective, we will all learn something. We'll all take away something. I'll take away from those that I, from others that I listen to in your programs. And it's, uh, it's all part of continuing to grow this profession. Brilliant. Griff, thank you so much. Thank you very much. And that's a wrap. And don't forget, if you want to access your free training to learn how to structure your firm or practice for freedom, fulfillment and profit, please visit smartpracticemethod.com. Or if you'd like to speak to one of our advisors directly, follow the link in the information. If you enjoyed today's show, please head on over to iTunes and leave us a review. I read every single one. Also, I'd love to get your feedback on this particular episode or the show in general, as well as your recommendations. You can reach us by emailing podcast at businessofarchitecture.com. This podcast is brought to you by Business of Architecture, a leading architect business consultancy. Access our free training on how to structure your architecture firm for more freedom, fulfillment, and financial success by going to smartpracticemethod.com. The views expressed on this show by my guests do not represent those of the host, and I make no representation, promise, guarantee, warranty, pledge, contract, bond, or commitment, except to help you conquer the world. Carpe diem.